I'm Ruben. I um, uh, just started my PhD at the C2DH in Luxembourg. And last year in 2019, I participated in the uh, Helsinki uh, DH Hackathon together with Sarah, who is a, a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, uh, Innsbruck University. And today we'd like to uh, talk about our experience during the hackathon and uh, to draw some lessons uh, from the collaboration between different disciplines in the hackathon. We are not, uh, uh, um, just as a small disclaimer, we're not exactly the twins you'd expect at, uh, in this session. I'm an historian um, and Sarah is also an historian, uh, but in our group, I did uh, uh, most of the programming. So I hope I can say something uh, uh, on the collaboration between also the computer scientists in our group. Um, some uh, short notes about the uh, hackathon. Um, the hackathon has uh, been running for a couple of years now and aims to foster collaboration between uh, humanists, computer scientists, data scientists, but also linguists. Um, and uh, different groups uh, uh, try to answer humanities questions with computational methods. Um, and the groups consist of uh, a wide variety of scholars from all over the world. Um, and the last edition in 2019 was especially international because of the support by uh, Claren. Um, in our group were uh, uh, seven historians, two linguists, uh, three computer scientists, and uh, uh, one literary scholar. And uh, this is representative for all the groups in the 2019 edition. Um, and the groups are divided uh, uh, based on different data sets. So there was a group um, dealing with European parliamentary data, a group working with Twitter data, one with the ECHO data set on early modern publications. And our group uh, worked with uh, British Library uh, newspapers from the 19th century. Um, and our research question, because every group has to formulate a research question in the first days, so there was not pre predetermined. Um, our question was how did 19th century medical advertisers sell their goods? Um, because in the 19th century, you see the decline of uh, a quakery, so the the selling of pills and uh, uh, lotions, which were not exactly working always, but um, uh, uh, that's precisely the reason why they were banned from newspapers. Um, and we tried to study how these uh, these Quakers uh, uh, um, sold their goods in the newspapers. The proposed solution then, um, uh, we work with the uh, British Library newspaper uh, data as said, uh, we took a subset, the Morning Post, uh, because it runs uh, throughout the 19th century and is quite substantial in, in quantity. Um, and to study our question, we uh, uh, divided the workload um, in, in roughly four steps. So first, the data scientists in our group would um, aggregate the newspaper metadata um, on the quantity, on the location of different newspapers and uh, um, the quality of, for example, the OCR. Um, and they would supply the historians with these uh, um, statistical insights. Then the historians together with the data scientists and computer scientists would uh, classify the medical ads. Um, because we had only one and a half week, we, we weren't able to train a proper classifier, but um, the historians would close read different ads and then supply the the data scientists and computer scientists with specific keywords uh, based on which we could uh, um, um, identify medical ads. Um, then the historians also together with the computer scientists would uh, try to identify the goods branded in the ad, so pills or lotions, for example, um, and also extract the publics that were targeted because one aspect of our research was also see if um, male uh, or female-oriented ads targeted these publics differently. Um, and then the computational linguists in our group um, studied the, the language of persuasion in the medical ads. So the results are described in the paper, of course, um, but the main findings were that the male and female-oriented ads uh, had some clear differences in the way they addressed their publics. Uh, and also uh, in the, the, the illnesses they tried to address. So in the 19th century, uh, the female-oriented ads mentioned frequently um, mental illnesses, while the male-oriented ads uh, often uh, mentioned like physical uh, uh, sicknesses. 
Um, and there's also distinct patterns in uh, linguistic markers for persuading audiences. So, for example, repetition of certain words in an ad because there weren't any images in the early 19th century was a clear uh, way of trying to catch the attention of the reader. So talking about the collaboration, um, the, the hackathon was really like a pressure cooker for DH collaboration and um, two factors uh, sort of contributed to this pressure cooker effect. So the first was space. Um, the group was together in one room. Um, so the, it was a very favorable geography of practice uh, as Max Cameron called. Um, and that, that really made a difference because you, you overhear the data scientist talk as a historian and vice versa. Um, so that, that was really a, a motivation to work closely together. Um, then there was also like time pressure. So that also uh, um, promotes collaboration because there were clear goals. We had to deliver a poster and a blog post and a, a final presentation. Um, but precisely under this pressure, we also found some, some challenges. Um, and the most important one we call disciplinary isolationism or disciplinary drift. So under time pressure, um, the different disciplines, so historians and the data scientists would uh, uh, sort of automatically resort to familiar methods. So um, if we had a deadline for a blog post uh, the next day, uh, the historian, for example, would say, well, I just try to, to close read some ads so we have any results and then we do the, the fancy computational stuff as an extra uh, because we're not sure if something comes out of it. So that was really interesting to see that um, this, this, uh, this dynamic uh, occurred in, in, in every discipline, so to say. So the data scientists would, would say, well, I just uh, assembled some statistics so we have something to present. Um, so this, this dynamic of disciplinary drift uh, really occurred frequently. And the first one was the, the creation of a shared vocabulary. So uh, um, Federico already mentioned the, the idea of a, a translation. Um, and that was really important. In the first two days, it was just a matter of getting to know the other language. So the historians would learn about uh, uh, OCR, the quality of the OCR, measuring that, uh, normalizing word frequencies, um, uh, getting to know what word embeddings are. Um, well, the data scientists would learn about what you can say based on distant reading and, and what, what, what close reading actually entails and how it can benefit uh, statistical uh, measurements. Um, so this took a couple of days, but uh, once the, the um, uh, shared vocabulary was in place, um, the group really integrated well. Um, the second factor then was uh, already uh, um, mentioned also by Federico and some other presentations, the, the crucial position of intermediaries or, or translators. So we had a couple of historians in the group. They were also uh, programming themselves, having experience with um, uh, computational methods. And, and they really uh, formed the crucial bridge. Uh, but then the danger, of course, is that these people uh, are doing all the work. So and uh, it was interesting to see that um, um, if a historian is able to program, it, it's tempting to let him do all the work because you know, he knows both fields. Um, and that brings us also to the third factor, leadership, especially leadership in research design. So in the beginning, it was really uh, helpful to have these intermediaries being the, the group leaders, uh, um, um, telling us what was possible, what was not possible in this short time span. So um, our recommendation for uh, future DAs collaboration is uh, develop a shared vocabulary, um, uh, work with these intermediaries, train them, uh, and also provide good leadership in the research design. Thank you very much.